Okay, so I went ahead and put the old claw back in there, but I used the larger, newer, better quality screws. Uh, I have one spring in here, and I'm getting ready to uh, use, oh no, my leather bit to put that in there. I'm going to drop that into this hole. I'm going to grab this and put that right on like that. How about that? Happy little spring. Okay, now that's two. And uh, what I might end up needing to do, oh, that feels really hard as it is. That's fine. In fact, I'll probably have to loosen these when it's done because I can just feel that's taking it a lot just to move that. So these are great. That's really strong. You know, I need to re-solder this even though that's didn't really need to happen. But that's fine. We'll go ahead and peel that off there a little bit. So this will be re-soldered, and then we'll do the plate. And then next will be the neck restring intonate, and hopefully it'll be good. All right, I've got my solder. I got my solder tip cleaner thingy. It's a bunch of metal filing nastiness there. Got my soldering iron, and uh, this is one of those instances where you know. And, and honestly, I don't want to. I don't want to come across as one of these like people who knocks things made in other countries because I'm really not like that at all. I think that it's actually really foolish to assume that the Chinese are crappy at making everything or that you don't want to buy something unless it's made in America. I don't believe that. I do think that Americans uh, make great stuff. Their sta our standard of quality is very, very high. And that if you buy things made in America, you're obviously you're supporting, you know, but there's a lot of, uh, there's a guy out there who owns a, a factory in America. And so the stuff he has says made in America. Does that mean that the money is going to America? No, it doesn't mean that. It means it's going into the pocket of whoever owns that factory. So, you know, just suppose that a Chinese guy that was really rich owned the Gibson Guitar Factory. Then you would say, oh, I have to buy Gibsons because they're made in America, but the money is going to whoever owns that factory. It's like Budweiser. Forever, Budweiser was the greatest. It was made in America. It was the, uh, you know, earmark of American uh, ingenuity. and the, What's it say on the can? It was the most expensive to brew with beech wood aging and blah, 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 blah. And then Imbev bought them. Imbev, the European, you know, beer conglomerate that buys it, that gobbled. They're, they're, a, they're a beer gobbler. They buy up all the different companies. They did it with St. Pauli Girl. They did it, they do it with everybody. I loved St. Pauli Girl. Then one day I drank it and I was like, man, this doesn't taste the same. It's not the same. Then they changed the artwork on the can. I stopped drinking it because it was like that. You know, you find out that your uh, favorite beer is uh, now an InBev beer. Well, you're not actually participating now in that whole I bought American because it's the greatest thing ever thing. Now your your money, even though you think you're buying something that's, you know, American, is going to some rich guy somewhere else. So when it comes to Chinese stuff, yeah, there's a good chance some guy who owns that factory is the one making the money and you're supporting whatever and you're getting a cheap thing it's not oh not going to be high enough quality and ip they don't respect ip at all a great example of who china really is screwing though is japan uh, suppose you watch a anime cartoon and you say oh i'm in love with this is my waifu i like this character so you see a $500 Japanese sculpture of that character. Well, the Chinese will copy it and then sell a $50 to $100 duplicate of that sculpture. It won't be as good, and, uh, but people will buy it. And so the re a part of the reason why the cost of those uh, statues is so high is so they can get their money at all because they know China's going to copy it. And when China copies it, they're not going to make as much money off of it. So they already know that's what's going to happen. And if China didn't do that, if they had some law protecting IP, which they don't, 
then the statue from Japan would cost a lot, lot less. It would be like, it would be significantly less. And then you might be able to get it. So it plays that way. And, and I don't know if, I don't think that's how it is with guitars. You know, in my opinion, uh, with guitars in particular, and, and probably with a few other things out there, um, the... Uh, you know, okay, if you buy a Chibson, you're not hurting Gibson because you were never going to buy a Gibson. And if you're going to buy a Gibson, you were going to buy a Gibson all along, and that's not hurting Gibson. But what's actually happening is the fakes are making the real ones more valuable. Someone says, oh, man, that's a that's a that's an American-made Gibson, and I can tell that's that super high-quality standard that we're all looking for uh, Gibson, then uh, then that's worth that much. Yeah, it is. It's worth that much. Uh, it's, I'm not saying that it costed, the parts are worth that much. I'm not saying that even really the workmanship is worth that much. It's not. But the resale value is still there. And there, if there are people out there who are like, okay, I'm going to go spend two thousand dollars. Oh, it's a fake! It's a fake! I got screwed. Well, you probably should have done a little more homework on how to identify a real or fake Gibson before you plunked your bucks down to get a Gibson guitar. And anyone today with the internet can easily just go down that rabbit hole, and you're going to say, wait, this doesn't have fret nubs. Or wait, this one doesn't have this or that on the headstock. You're going to be able to tell relatively easily if it's fake or whatever. And so Chimpsons, really, they make real Gibsons worth more. You know, most people might not think that. And there, and there's a, there are people who like who like Chimpsons, and it's because Chimpsons are fun. You could buy it, you could uh, relic it, you could put new pickups in it. You don't ever have to worry about it messing up and then you lost a two or three thousand dollar or more or whatever investment in that guitar. So I, I'm not one of those people that thinks you should not buy a Chinese guitar. I actually think that we should get along with China and China should get along with us and that if you want to buy something that's cool. Of course, you know, there, there are problems with the lack of any kind of enforcement of IP laws with China. And uh, uh, one thing that I think of is uh, Transformers. Hasbro and Takara, Japanese and American companies, make Transformers toys. Well, in China, they get those toys and they make a figure called Deformation. And the figures are often oversized. They look better. They put metal parts in them. They change what would appear to be flawed, flaws in the designs or maybe uh, just the details, uh, things in the details that might not look good. And so you end up with a better product, and it's cheaper. Uh, and so a lot of the stuff you're buying, regardless of it's Takara, Hasbro, whoever made it, it's from China. So I don't want to be a person that says, oh, that's from China, it's crap. This guitar, when I bought it, I knew it was from China. And uh, there are things about the guitar where if I knew about it, I might not have bought it. Uh, like, I don't necessarily think a bone nut is the greatest nut ever. I actually think that tusk nuts are probably better than artificially made. Not tusk, like real tusk from some rare animal or something, but the T-U-S-Q. Or graphite nuts are better. Uh, Well-prepared brass nuts are better. And that has to do with the consistency of the structure of the nut. There are like kind of a bubbly, dusty kind of consistency to a bone nut where you really got to be careful. Now, one thing that happens with a bone nut over the life of it is it's constantly wearing away. And that's just how all guitar nuts are. The, as a string drags across it and it's tuned, it is bent and stuff, it's slowly digging away at that a groove in that nut. With bone nuts, that happens pretty fast. Everyone's going to say the best nut is a bone nut. I disagree with that. I don't want beef bone nuts. I, I got this guitar, and it does have that nut. And when I went to cut it, 
I got it just about as perfect as I could, and then one string was just slightly just a little too low. And I don't want to fill that with crap. I don't want to super glue it. I could, you know, I could take it out and replace it, I guess, or whatever. But if it's properly prepared, then there are better things than bone, in my opinion. You know, then most people are going to disagree with that. They're going to say, oh, no, it's got to be, and I've got a million of these guitars, and they're all bone, and it's the greatest. I don't care. You're not going to I, I play a lot. That's another thing is I played forever before I actually started working on guitars. I changed my strings, and that's about it. I didn't mess with truss rods very much, if at all. I didn't get into the electronics of it, and I didn't care. I didn't, it wasn't, uh, you know, a thing to me. But then, you know, about uh, maybe going on six or seven years ago, I started really getting into working on my own instruments and taking them apart. I've made my own guitar and uh, from a kit. I've worked on all of my instruments. I have uh, over like 27 instruments and worked on all of those and done uh, fret work, pickups and stuff. I've changed out all kinds of things. I've I've done little cutesy fartsy like changing the knobs and stuff. I've also, you know, turned guitars that really weren't that great into really good playing instruments by using the right kind of stuff and the right uh, the right tweaks and adjustments here and there. So I'm not saying that Oh, this is Chinese crap. In fact, when this gets a better neck, I think this is going to be a really, really fantastic instrument. And the neck it has is actually not that bad, but it's really not that good either. And I think it's, uh, I don't know, it's just, uh, and I love maple necks. Maple is my favorite neck. I'll use a rosewood neck if I, if I have to. Um, but if someone's just going to say, okay, we're going to build you a guitar, what do you want? I'm always going to say Maple Deck no matter what. It's my absolute favorite. The feel, the sound, and just the way it looks and everything about it. It's aesthetically pleasing and it plays good and it looks good and it is good. So, yeah, I'm going to pick a Maple Deck. Body, uh, you know, a lot of times you don't know. It could be an alder. Uh, usually it's a cheap kind of basswood or something. And this, I think, is a cheap basswood. Uh, but, uh, you know, that doesn't matter much. It really doesn't, unless you have to have a super lightweight guitar or unless you think the d density or, or whatever of the wood matters. I know that the overall rigidity of it does matter to a degree, especially around the pocket. And, uh, you know, but you, you don't want a cheap, flimsy one. But there are plywood guitars that people think are great. There are basswood, alder body, and whatever you can come up with that has been used in a mahogany, which is, I guess, you know, super, super awesome. As long as it's not rainforest mahogany, it's really great. Let's go ahead and give that a test. Oh, yeah, that is perfection. That is, oh, wow. That's going to be an extremely good bridge. Wow, love it. Okay, can't wait. Can't wait to get this done. All right, now I'm going to take the uh, neck out. I might have a shim that pops out. So, yeah, it's very easy. Sometimes it's not. Now you have a like a 55 and a half millimeter, sometimes 56 millimeter, or even like 55 I guess. Somewhere between 55 and 56 millimeter is usually what you're going to get in this pocket once you get the, uh, up into where the neck is actually making contact and is bolted on. You're going to get uh, between 55 and 56 millimeters. And so of course if you get a replacement neck and it's too thick or too uh, tall, that's going to be a problem. And uh, so I, I like to make a little uh, kind of a template. I'll, I'll measure out 55 and a half, or 55, or even uh, 56, but I'll start with 55 and a half, and just take a uh, measuring 
utensil, whatever you've got that does millimeters, and I'll cut out a piece of cardboard, a little square, that is exactly that length with a nice straight edge on it. And then you can just hold it up to something and compare it. That's uh, really easy. And so that's why I knew that the screws from this bridge would fit right into the body of this guitar because I checked the measurements precisely. If you check the measurements, and if, you're, if someone's selling you a bridge and they don't have the measurements up there for it, well, maybe you already know or maybe you don't need it, but it's kind of stupid to do that because when a person's buying that bridge, obviously the distance between the uh, fittings matters and the length of it matters. So if they don't have that on there, then it's kind of, uh, it's, it inhibits your ability to know that that is a usable bridge for what you're doing. So we've got this off here now, and you can see I have a little shim there, and you can also see where this was uh, kind of rapidly, poorly, it's kind of sharp actually, cut at the factory to fit this neck pocket. Not exactly the best job there. And I've got the shim, uh, and then another thing that I do is I take some of these really thin gift cards or leftover cards, this is a uh, like a speedy reward card, and I chop them up, and these are extremely strong, thin, reliable shims. Um, they're not wood, and they're not from Stumac, and they're not $50, but they work great. I just cut a couple little notches out of it, make sure it's the right width and then I put it right up there like that in the pocket and then that's a perfect little and uh, I've had a lot of success with these and I've heard people say don't use those but wood's going to compress this right here is going to have very little little to no compression and you know of course a lot of guitars when you uh, when you check them because you don't always need a shim a shim serves a purpose if you're if you're dealing with um, the bridge and you have lowered these saddles down so much that you've got like little pokey saddle bits popping up out of the tops of each of these saddles and you still can't get your action where you want it at the neck that might be an indicator that you need to add a shim and that shim is going to tilt the neck back very slightly just so slightly and then when then you can begin to raise these saddles back up again and I mean, I might just start with all the saddles raised up as high as they can go. And then when the neck is put in and the shim is on there, then adjust the saddles down to get to the right height on the neck. But that's when you're going to need a shim is, of course, if the saddle is way too low and you still can't get the action that you want up at the high part of the neck. You don't always need one, but you'll pop these necks off of your guitars and you'll see a shim made of masking tape, a piece of sandpaper flipped over, a piece of paper, a piece of cardboard, a business card. A, if Stu Mac, it's going to be a fine cut piece of expensive exotic wood that's approximately that width exactly. And you can sand this down or shape it however you want. This works great. It's a perfectly doable, great shim. I, I recommend it. And probably, again, like my string choices, no one else is likely to recommend that. But I will. I'll say, hey, use what you got. And people have these things. like I wouldn't use the really puffy ones, like with raised lettering, like from Visa or something like that. Use the thin ones that are cheap. And uh, they're a nice, thin plastic. They work great. So, yeah, I shimmed that. Of course, there's the neck. You can look and see where it was... Uh, prepared. It has a tiny little uh, kind of a, it looks like a hammer mark almost on there. And they have a hole through the neck, just like if this was some fender. And the fenders use an adjustment pin, which is like, you don't need a shim if you have that, because if you if you have your neck on there and you know it needs a, just the most minuscule adjustment, you just turn that thing and it pushes up into the neck or pushes down. I guess that's what that's going to do for you. I mean, I, I'm not 100% sure. But I don't use those. But uh, in this particular case, I know I'm not going to need that. And the new neck I get may not need a shim, but it might. So I'm going to keep that there. And if I need it, I'll use it. It's all going to be when I get it and uh, set it up in here. So this old one's going to be gone. And uh, these are those 
cheap closed tuners. A little rattly, it feels like maybe the little nut on them needs a little tightening. With the better rollers, uh, roller trees on them, I would recommend one of the first things you need to do if you get a cheap guitar with that really super cheap uh, folded up metal string trees is get these because your tuning stability is going to go up. Of course, you also want to file your nut towards the towards the tuners at kind of a downward angle towards the tuners and not too much and you want to widen them a little because a lot of these are set up for nines if you use tens you're going to have to widen your slots um, that's going to affect whether the strings pinching up in the nut and then of course if the string trees are snagging that's going to affect it you're going to get kind of a, a like a, a effect where it's backing off a little bit while you're uh, tuning or detuning you, you it will not be right so this makes it so there's no friction at all. The string is just gliding right underneath this little soft kind of barrel shape and it, it fits it perfectly. So the string has no additional tension from the tree, but it lowers it to, um, to allow it to have the right type of angle for the string to sound right. Because this neck isn't, isn't, uh, doesn't have an angle. There's no neck angle here at all. It's just cut down. And then for these lower strings, because they're not having such a quick break angle to reach their tuning machines, they have to have these trees to pull them down before they then go up to meet with their tuning machines. And otherwise these strings won't sound right. They'll kind of have like a lap guitar sound to them. They won't sound right. They'll be twangy and kind of weird sounding and it just won't it's not good for for anything so these are necessary but I would recommend using these instead of those trees that you get on all of the cheap strats some of the expensive strats a lot of stuff out there comes with uh, I get these and replace them they're really easy to replace a little tiny bit of work maybe a drill bit and uh, lining it up so yeah now um, I'm gonna take off this just to show the what's work, what's going on on the inside, and then the next step will be trying on the new neck. All right, we're about to take this off, and we'll just kind of reveal what's going on in this. And this is supposed to be better than the entry level uh, Glary Strat copy. I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull up here. It looks like, uh, of course, really short, small wiring, so it's hard to see what's going on underneath here. Have to, uh, let me see here. Yeah, I can't. Uh, okay, yeah, okay. I can pull a little, I love a little bit of leeway there. And we'll pull up on this, and we can flip it over. And uh, now we're looking in here. And uh, honestly, this wire is not not bad this is actually a braided kind of cloth wire and so is the orange and the blue and the black they're all kind of thicker now this is a cheap switch everyone's gonna say oh that's a terrible cheap switch now um, my son Nick is here Hello. so I'm gonna ask him a question quick do these look like nickels or dimes Dimes. Okay, so Nick knows these are dime pots. These are not nickel pots. We know these are cheap Chinese dime pots. They're not like uh, sought after super high quality 500k pots. They're probably 250k and they're cheap Chinese nickel or dime pots and they're okay. They've each got um, a capacitor, a little green capacitor on them and it looks like, believe it or not, some shielding tape right here which I just realized this is shielded so honestly I don't know most of the uh, most of the uh, Chinese guitars that are really really cheap I don't know if they actually shield their stuff I don't know if they spend the time to shield their stuff so two points of, 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 of interest for quality on this instrument that are immediately noticeable is that the wires are actually kind of thick and they have a braided kind of look and feel to them. These, uh, of course, they're not like they're really thick fabric 
braided stuff like on Gibsons and stuff like that but these are actually higher quality wire than a lot of the cheaper guitars that I've seen have that's very very good that immediately stands out as being better at least as a kind of a step better than the than the entry level super super crappy stuff and like I said this is the second this is the GST2 model it's supposed to be an upgrade on the GST which is their Strat copy there's a lot of stuff in here and uh, it's also like a lot of these Glaries and a whole lot of guitars nowadays that you get no matter where they're from it is set up for HSH right away so this is for a humbucker if you want single coil and another humbucker so you can do super strat setup HSH or HSS or I guess if you're loony SSH like I've seen on a couple of them out there it's not absolutely reprehensibly terrible it's actually somewhat acceptable on the inside of this guitar definitely needed cleaned up it had nasty dust and dirty stuff from factory kind of nastiness in there so yeah we've seen the inside of it and these are branded Wilkinson's but they you know are not well okay I'll just say Wilkinson did a video recently about building one of his guitar kits that you can purchase from Stu Mac and those come with Wilkinson pickups and those pickups that it comes with are extremely high quality somewhat expensive pickups these are not those these are staggered pole probably the equivalent of an El Nico 5 or, or something like that and then they are branded Wilkinson it's a little feely kind of uh, dip down tactile lettering but they are okay these are pretty good pickups I like them so that's where I'm at with those I I would recommend being less picky about pickups and be more picky about the sound you're getting from your amp and the amp you're using and stuff before you start like criticizing every little tiny detail of everything so yeah we've seen the inside of a GST2 and I've said it three times now but the next step is putting the new neck on this guitar all right, so we've got the uh, the new neck here, and I'm going. I'm comparing it to the old neck, uh, so we can see the nut's already been filed, and it looks like a pretty good job. It looks like it might match up. Um, I went ahead and checked it out with my uh, uh, ruler. This is. Um, as I'm looking, this is extremely flat all the way through. Maybe the, t you know, it's it's there. Yeah, it's flat. So this neck is flat. Um, I felt the fret edges. There's a teensy tiny bit of fret edges, especially as you get to the top. I'm going to deal with that before this goes on the body. I've test fitted it to the body, and it is a tighter fit than this original neck. So. When this goes in, it's going to be a tighter fit, and uh, that's better. It's usually better to have that. Of course, you don't have any looseness or sway. Um, it also, um, even though they are the same uh, thickness here, I think that the radius on this newer neck is slightly rounder, as it probably should be if it's going to be like that classic Fender radius, which will put the frets possibly slightly higher okay now this is not a fender neck but it does have this kind of and when I bought this <clears throat> it had a disclaimer within it saying that you know that whatever courts have already said that this headstock has shown so much that it's not owned I guess but I'm not trying to say oh this is fender it's not this is a a blank kind of neck set up to look like that original fender uh, music uh, music note which that's what I'm pretty sure that is is a music note is what this is supposed to look like um, I used to call it a, a nipple I don't know why and it's got your 10 millimeter uh, and these are the same these are modern older vintage uh, fender 
and other stuff will have a uh, smaller, I think seven or eight, uh, I think seven millimeter hole, and so your 10 millimeter stuff's obviously obviously not going to fit. But this should fit the newer stuff. Uh, get, give away, it's not, you know, at least your high end fender stuff is there's no wood plug around the uh, truss opening. There there'd be a, a darker wood that's a shape around that, and. Uh, I, I like the, the wood grain pattern though. It has kind of an appealing swirly kind of and maybe that might be why it was uh, possibly rejected somewhere. I can see now there's kind of a I don't know, a little stainy color right there that I might, I might try to sand that off or clean it off. I'll clean it, maybe clean that off if it can come off. And uh, this is a cheap fender look-alike neck. Uh, the old one of course uh, like I said, got filthy when it got worked on. And um, two machines. So I'm going to do the frets, uh, the edges. I'm going to test it with a rocker uh, just to see where we are with that. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, just check all of this. I probably should go ahead and use the longer edge just so if I'm, if I'm, you know showing and then someone's going oh how do I do that the longer edge is for the wider frets then as you get down here you flip it and then now you're on the second longer edge and I've got a bit of a, a rise here this guy here is up a little tiny bit see hear it where I'm doing this uh, that's because this guy's lifting up the uh, fret rocker and uh, yeah it's from about the midpoint up clo closer to the high east side it's not not bad again this guy Okay. And I found that um, quite often as you get closer to the 12th fret, that's when you're getting to your rocking frets. This guy is a little bit high. Go ahead and uh, switch here again. As you get, uh, and I've noticed uh, some guitars I've worked on, the 12th fret is the only place where there are problems. Like I find that, you know, these two guys right here are often... Uh, the grumpier of the frets that will pop or or be a little too uh, too high and this one looks like maybe no I don't actually no and when, and when you're using this tool this type of tool the radius of the neck will aggravate your your progress with it if I turn this slightly or if it's on the radius wrong, you might get a rocking motion when there actually isn't any high fret because you've got the actual uh, rocker um, tilted against the radius um, of the neck. And so if, if this rocker is, is slightly tilted, you're going to get a wobble in there, and that's a false read of your, uh, of your tool. You want to make sure that, it's, that if you've got a nice you know, rounded like whatever, uh, seven and a half up to maybe nine or ten radius. As you get towards eleven and twelve, you start getting flatter necks, like what's on uh, some of the Harley Bentons and other guitars. You'll you'll start get to a getting into a flat enough radius to where you're not really having to to curve your um, your rocker so much. There's this guy's got a little bit there. You're not going to have to curve your rocker so much to adapt um, to make sure to get a proper reading. But if you're doing this and you notice a, uh, just the slightest, teensiest little rock, make sure you're flat against the fret and you're not actually tilting the rocker, allowing the radius to create that little wobble. Because it will. So uh, it looks like maybe I've got four or five and they're spaced out enough to where the whole thing probably could use a level crown polish fret all that stuff so it's probably going to need the whole work now uh, I know I'm just going to be the king of unpopular opinions but I don't 
tape off everything unless there's really some kind of really good reason to do that. I don't tape off every single, I don't use a, a you know, drawer load of uh, masking tape every time I work on these. And the only neck I've ever had that has, you know, kind of had enough dryness and openness to the, to the grain of the wood that's, that's stained it has been this cheaper glary neck where it's gobbled up some of that uh, nastiness. You can just really see it here where when I did the work it, it gobbled up some of that nasty. But I've none of my other instruments that I've ever worked on where I didn't use tape. And of course if you're going to want to be able to handle uh, your uh, fret file to do this because if you don't you're going to end up missing every occasionally and having little uh, and, and even just a couple of those will happen even if you're using uh, countermeasures like tape or little guards or something. I've noticed the metal guard pieces that they sell that cover the fret will often cut a tiny little line in the wood if you're using those to avoid taping it. And if you tape it and you miss hard enough, the tape's not going to protect the wood from a nice little dent in your fret. So the very best way to handle it, I guess if you're going to tape it, that's cute and it resources if you have that stuff. And I kind of, I do, but I don't want to use it. It's, it's really more because it's just easier to do it nice and quick and get that done. And I've done enough fret work now to where I'm pretty much straight on the whole entire time. And I don't have to worry about it. So when I do this work, I don't put tape over every single fret all the way up and down the entire neck and cover it all. Nothing. What I do is I make a big mess of dust and it ends up metal dust and, uh, and the, um, fi the filings from um, the little curly metal pieces from the quad uh, uh steel wool that I use cl closer to the end of it. I'll just bring out my, uh, my vacuum here and uh, suck up all of that stuff off the fretboard and off this old t-shirt that I'm using here. Okay, so Again, just like I said, you know, people are not going to agree with me. I'm going to say GHS strings are great. They're going to say they suck. I'm going to say um, that, uh, you know, bone nuts are not the greatest. They're going to say they are the greatest. I'm going to say you don't have to tape your neck up to do your frets. They're going to say you have to tape your neck up to do your frets. So I'm probably going to, like I said, going to be like the king of unpopular opinions on this, but I don't. I don't do that. I think it's kind of a waste of resources sometimes. And a lot of the guys I watch that are some of my favorite channels tape them up every time and I love watching it. And I'm happy. I know they're doing a great job. And that little extra amount of protection is probably worth it. You know, and, and, they're, and they're still good. But when I do this, I um, uh, first I test them all again. I'll use my rocker and go over everything again. Uh, just like everybody else does, I'll use a marker to mark each of the frets um, that need addressed. I'll use a level sander to lightly sand over until everything is matching up. And you know when you have a raised one you're sanding it and it's lowering it to meet the level of the fret. But all of the frets are getting a little bit of leveling when that happens. And sometimes they'll say we'll just go ahead and uh, beat on it with a hammer or something like that and uh, that's a good idea you know so you want to get um, this little guy here I wouldn't use you want to use something that's not going to mar, dent, scratch or twist metal like a carpenter's nail hammer you don't want to use that I guess a brass hammer might be good because it's less likely to harm it but this is a plastic and then a little this is a soft plastic almost like a a skateboard bushing kind of thing and then this is a uh, harder but still plastic and so I might tap the fret that I think is a little too high and then and then check it again and so you want one of these guys to do that this is um I, what is this a tool shop guaranteed forever is what it says on it hammer and these come off too. This comes off, I guess maybe the part that's guaranteed forever is this, and then if this thing gets ate up, you just get another one of these and uh, screw it on here very easily. 
So as far as the neck pocket goes, again, I've, I've test fitted it three or four times and so it's taken a little uh, kind of a nibbly nibbles out of here where uh, test fitting it. And, but it does fit perfectly, really, really tight, which is what I want. Okay, and um, again, I do some of this work at least, starting out with my file. The same one I used to um, get that neck out a little bit, only the other side of it. I'm going to use this file, and it's um, really uh, close together, fuzzy kind of grain. It's not, not wide like this guy that could like saw through wood, and I'm not going to be using the, the grating edge, the sawing kind of grating edge of this thicker one. I'm going to be using the soft, flat, non-abrasive edge that complements this softer one to go down each of these and uh, just get rid of any kind of little sharpness. So I feel the sharpness here on the end and then I'm just going to go right in there and uh, sometimes you might want to just go in one direction only like that and you can also use this uh, to round, lightly round the edges of your um, of your neck if you uh, if you like that, which I do. I like, of course, it's comfortable. If you're playing a guitar and the edges are not, uh, the edges of the neck are really flat and kind of sharp, that's uncomfortable. And so a neck that comes with a more rounded edge, which this one kind of does actually, it's just the slightest bit rounded, but I can go over everything here in this edge and just kind of add just a little more roundness to soften it up to take the bite out of it and then all the way down the neck that's going to be a really nice comfortable neck to play. A lot of guitars um, even if they have a good fret job the closer you get to the pocket the more sharp stuff you're going to get down here and it's very common that the sharp stuff they seem the most important stuff is the cowboy chords then into the middle of the guitar and then the the business end of the faster metal and uh, you know whatever sweeping arpeggio, peggio and, and uh, you know rapid lead guitar kind of stuff this will matter to be but then up here because no fingers or hands are ever even touching that or using it maybe they'll just let this go and not be as uh, soft or sh uh, as uh, filed down as, it, as they need to but I would of course want everything to be completely soft and not have any hanging fret bits or anything like that going on. So just a quick... Now that one's already lost its sharpness all around the fret. There's no sharpness at all. This guy's got some of it, so I'm just going to go down. And of course I'm using a Leatherman. And the file is... Uh, really 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 good file and I'm just rounding right around the edge there we go no sharpness at all there's no sharpness there now at all here there's a tiny bit and I'm going to do the edge And a lot of times guys will do this side, then this side, then this side, then this side, all the way down the neck, then flip the neck over. And then that's when they'll do the other side. They, I, I, I kind of flip around the file and then try the same rolling angle that I'm using, only backwards on the other side. So that's just so I'm not having to, to uh, focus, like flipping it around all, all over the place. But it works. Okay, maybe a view of the edges might help when we're looking at this. As you can see here, um, how I've softened this up. And then if you look down here, see that has a sharper, visibly kind of sharper edge uh, to the fret right here. It's sharp. So this one I just did some on it. Not as sharp. It's not... Uh, and it rounds it eventually. Once uh, I, 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 a lot of guys do 
their fret work in different ways. Uh, like um, oh, a couple guys I watch that I really, really love, I enjoy watching, they use fret erasers. And I like those. They're really cool. They have different grades. But when I was first doing the frets, I was a fret butcher. And I used the erasers and I just wore them out. I wore them out and I was never getting the effect that I wanted. I, I eventually I realized I was just using kind of using the erasers wrong. It wasn't working. Okay, so uh, got slightly interrupted there. But uh, so as I check these, I'm going to make sure there's not no none of the f hanging nub part where the fret was uh, first. Um, smush down into the neck you'll get uh, this metal where the metal has been sometimes there's filler there and the very edge of the top of the metal has decided to poke out a tiny bit I gotta make sure to get rid of that and then the sharp edges of the flat part of the fret that go onto the top of the neck can hang over and of course I have to make sure to get rid of that and most necks that go from warm to cold are gonna sprout and stick out stuff and so you have to deal with them just like I said earlier um, if you're going to work on a guitar in my opinion you might want to work on it in the winter time or in cold dry controlled temperatures the cold dry is going to make the wood com compress and contract and then it's also going to make whatever frets are on it pop out or the edges of them stick out and be sharp if that's going to happen to the neck so if you do the work when it's cold, when, uh, when it's going to happen to the neck, then later on when it's warm or cold again, the frets aren't going to poke out again. I guess in theory, unless it gets much, much colder and much, much drier than it was when you worked on your guitar to create that situation. So we know uh, as the wood contracts, of course, the metal is going to pop out because the surface that it's on is getting smaller and when it gets warm it's going to hug up and snuggle up and then that's when the uh, when the frets I guess might uh, shift around more that because they're having a wider opens opening in the slot maybe you'll get some uh, maybe that's more likely to generate the higher popping up frets and stuff So, uh, but I, I mean, honestly, if you're going to work on frets, watch a hundred videos like I did. Watch guys that are crazy into detail. I watched a guy named Jason uh, who went through like a metamorphosis. He was uh, overweight, but he was showing how to do fret work. And he went through every tiny little intricate detail, zoomed in. He used magnifying glasses and five different kinds of expensive exotic diamond files and he made the best looking frets I've ever seen in my whole life and he probably charges $200 for a fret job instead of $75 to $100 and he works on expensive incredible professional instruments and stuff and then one day his videos stopped and a whole lot of time went by and when he came back he no joke he looked like a completely different person you could tell it was him he had lost all of his extra weight. I mean, I mean every bit of it. Every bit of it. He went from being, you know, kind of a, a, a obese person to looking like a cyclist. And I think he picked up cycling or and, and he picked up a better diet and just it all left him. And he looked great. But that guy was teaching like some of the very best, all of the essentials, every bit of the essentials that you're going to need to know. He's going to teach you. But when I do fret work, I have developed my own methods just like everybody else does. When they do this fret work, they develop their own ways. And I'm not the type of person that goes for gleaming, um, impressive mirror-like frets. I do want my frets to be perfect. I don't want them to be snaggy or scratchy or gritty in, in any way. And so I make sure that that doesn't happen. But... I don't like try to make them, you know, super, super clean mirror polish frets. I don't do that. What I do is the level, uh, 
then I do the crown, then I do the um, sanding with a sided sanding sponge. And the sponge has uh, a good grit for starting out um, the frets. And then I do a final with um, four aught steel wool. And the steel wool get, gets everywhere. It gets in everything and all over everything. And But it really, really does round off and soften and perfect every part of the frets. They, it looks super, super good. It's crude. It's a uh, caveman approach, I guess. But my frets are soft and clean and perfect, and they're, they're but they are not. Now, I could take one extra step to add a mirror shine to them, and then that would just be getting some metal polish from a uh, hard, from a, you know, a uh, automotive parts store or something for metal, and then adding that polish to a rag or something, and then going ahead and doing that. So if I wanted to do that, and I could, if someone said, look, I want these to a mirror polish, then yeah, I'd spend the 10 bucks for a bottle of some uh, crap from a uh, automotive parts store, and then the tube would be, just put it on there and then uh, go over it with a cloth. And that's going to add that little extra step of a fine polish. And some guys use a Stumac set, and the Stumac set will have uh, it will have every grade of grit of sandpaper that you really need to get it perfect. Now I'm going just one direction on this because I don't want my backwards direction to lift up on this sharp edge, and then just you know, kind of. Uh, make a redundant effort there where I'm just constantly bringing back up and then pushing back down a sharp edge of a fret. So instead I'm going to uh, get rid of the very top sharp edges and that's not sharp at all now and then a downward motion right on the edge here of the fret to get it where it's not going to poke out and stick anything. Later on when I go over this with the sponge and then with the aught, that aught stuff, that steel wool, is going to round this. And it's not going to like BB round it like the, uh, you know, these newer uh, stainless steel frets on a, on a Ert guitar or Ert, whatever their names are. It's, and on that note, um, I think stainless steel guitars might be something that... Uh, luthiers might not like very much because they eat tools. Stainless steel frets require much more tool work to work on them. So if you're like, oh, stainless steel frets are the best fret ever, they look great. And they have some process where they're getting these beautiful, gleaming, perfect frets. Well, when they get to you, if some of these frets are off and you have to do a complete level crown polish on the frets of a stainless steel fret, it's going to take more tooling, more tool work. And so it's going to eat up your tools faster. Someone that spent $300 on, on some of their files that they're using, that's going to eat that up really fast. Now, I got some Made in Japan files that are extremely good. They're not super expensive from uh, Stumac, but they are very high quality fret files. I also got very high quality Made in Japan nut files. That are really really good they weren't super expensive and they weren't stu mac but then when i got a cheap chinese tool set to just try to get a feel for all of the little stuff they come with yeah the fret rock rocker might have been completely bogus crap but the fret um, file on it was actually pretty good it wasn't that bad at all it worked totally fine the chinese crap cheapo whatever 10 to 15 dollar uh, fret file did a great job. It was very very easy to use and it did exactly what it was supposed to do. Now granted the little grainy grits in that thing, the little ribbing or whatever you want to call it, that's doing the real hard work in there is probably going to wear out faster and so you, uh, the cost you saved on it is going to 
you know, disappear as you have to get more of those possibly. But I've been through, um, you know, over, I have probably over 30 complete uh, fret jobs at least now. Even a couple of bass guitars thrown in there now too. And I've used um, five different fret files. Uh, the nice, uh, not not super expensive, but somewhat expensive Japanese ones. And I can say that the Japanese ones are going to last longer. But the Chinese one is doing essentially the same job, costs a lot less. And there were things about the Chinese one that I kind of liked. I think I like the feel of the handle slightly better. Um, so it works out that way. Now this guy's getting a little dirty, so I know I'm going to have to clean it up some. But yeah, let's see if I can get any kind of snaggy feelings in here, maybe. Okay, so you get the picture here. That's what I'm doing. I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, back off and then do all this work off camera so you're not getting uh, a fit of yawning and laughing at me. Like I'd probably do if I was watching myself. All right, I'm, as I'm almost done uh, reaching up the edge of this, I want to point out that even if I'm not feeling any sharp uh, hanging frets here, I'm going to round the corner edges of the fret um, and, and kind of add that uniformity as I'm moving up the neck. So all of this side is done, and I've went in and rounded every edge of every fret. Uh, when I go in to uh, hit it with that file, or I mean with the, uh, I mean with the uh, sanding sponge, it's going to really soften all of these little kind of angles that have happened as I've rounded off each of these. So when I round them off, I'm, I'm really going um, kind of at a, at a, at a um, controlled grade where I'm, I'm starting against the very edge of the sharp part, uh, sanding and then moving along to add a rounded little edge, and I'm doing that re again regardless of whether the fret is actually hanging out and kind of stabbing or not. I'm going to add that roundness, and I just personally believe that's a better fret to have it uh, rounded. When it's rounded like that, it's um, just all around softer, and it plays. Um, I don't know if that can focus in on it, but you can kind of see where a rounding is happening there on each of these. Now, you, of course, you can use whatever kind of files. They have uh, expensive and cheap guitar files for all of these things. Um, you don't want to push too hard on the edge of any file because then it starts to become kind of a dumb saw on your uh, wood of your of your fretboard so you definitely don't want to uh, remove too much either because it's a fret it's not gonna you're not gonna repair it if you remove too much material from the little metal part but softening the tip of the sharp part of the edge of the fret is what I'm doing here and I can feel already this is almost completely soft. I thought there might actually be a tiny bit left here. And remember, when you get used to feeling this, kind of try to focus on the lip of the edge softly. Because if you find that you're just matting your finger and smashing it down, you're going to keep on finding that there's an edge that you don't want to have to deal with your lip. But that's not actually the very edge of the fretboard that you're that you're actually eliminating the little sprouting part of the fret when you file it. So if you're uh, sawing away at it too much, what you'll end up doing is bringing back some of the wood, and you'll be pushing that boulder up the hill forever because you'll get rid of wood, this fret will stick out. You'll get rid of wood, the fret, or you'll 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 get rid of wood, fret will stick out. You'll soften the fret and get it close to the wood, but then you'll remove the wood, the fret will stick out, and you're just going to keep on doing that forever and ever. So you're, you should judge the feel by the e very edge, top kind of rounded part of the neck. 
because if you jam your finger on there you're going to feel the edge of the fret even if it's not too snaggy or sharp and or, or whatever you're going to feel it so and and you when you're pushing down to get rid of that if you're focusing too much on um, really pressing down hard on the edge of the fret of course you're going to uh, remove wood you're going to remove the material around the edges of the fret instead giving it a little extra toothiness uh, there on the edge that's definitely not what you want so by feel as I'm going down this there's no hang now there's no hanging there's no sharp stuff nothing and each of the edge of these is rounded um, so that when I take the sponge to it this is the sponge I use you can see it's been used here. It got snagged into some stuff here a little, but it's been used a lot. But this is a uh, it's a sanding sponge. Doesn't really run out very much. Um, these are great. I recommend them. They're just really great for work. I use a brush uh, to get off mo most of any kind of little bits before moving on to the next step. This is the cheaper file. I might start with this and then move over to my Hosco. The Hosco is the uh, higher quality Japanese made uh, fret. And I have those sitting there waiting in case I need to use them. This is the Hosco. Um, and these are good. Very good. And they are really not. And Hosco also makes, and they're not Stumac, they're not super expensive. Uh, Hosco also makes a handleless fret uh, file that um, I'd like to get. I, I think they look good. They're a good idea because when you're fret, uh, when you're filing frets, part of the problem of it is that you are doing this kind of scoopy uh, motion like this, and so your arm wants to push down and then level out, and that can kind of affect the wood. It can affect the frets. It can your own human motion of trying to create that. Uh, sawing effect there uh, is going to cause problems. So they have one where it's got the feeling part on the edge of the file itself and it has no handle. And then and it has uh, like these, uh, one on each side. One for a thicker, deeper fret, one for a more shallow, um, thinner fret. But they're all sized for the um, uh, six or so different sizes that you might encounter. Here are the other ones uh, for, for the varying grades. And you'll want to match up the grade. If you try to do this work and it's too wide, the edges are going to drill into the side. They're going to they're be grating kind of little ridges in the, in the pathway. But if you use the right size and you're, and you're not too rough with it, then it's not going to affect the wood at all. And uh, Hosco also does, um, Hosco makes um, nut slot files that are really high quality and they'll have two grades on the side. So three files will be your 10, 13, 17, 26, 36, 46 as you're going up the, uh, the nut slot. And this guy will probably not need, I don't know, it looks like it's already been cut pretty low. Especially the high, the, or the uh, fat E, the low E I should say. It looks kind of like it's right to begin with, but I don't know. It looks like it's already been cut well, and it's rounded. The nuts seems to be fitted well. Let's hope that that wasn't a problem. and. and uh, but it seems to be fitted well, and it uh, looks pretty good. So I'm going to finish up this, and then I'm going to start with the uh, further preparations. First, I'm going to do a rocker set again with a marker, and I'm going to try to hammer, even though, judging by the look here, well, this one might have a gap. If you check gaps on your frets, you might actually see where one or another is likely sticking up. I guess you also could probably get like a piece of paper or something and just kind of fit it under the fret and then you'll get a really good look at whether a fret is up even the slightest bit 
or if the paper can't even get under it because it's flush with the wood. Uh, here I can already see this one has a slight lift, just the ever slightest lift out of it. And if I hammer down here and it decides to make it form to the neck better, then that might eliminate a high fret point. So of course, if you can beat the fret back down into the board with a hammer instead of having to do an entire fret job over the thing, that's a lot easier and effective. But then a lot of times it's just glued in there and it's set and it's already raised and it's already fit, fixed into that kind of position. And the only way to get it right is going to be to level crown, polish the fret. So you have to do the whole, whole work. And that's probably more likely where this is going to end up. See, now I've got my sponge. And I'm just going to go right over the, this work I just did. Um, and this is immediately going to, like, round the edges of the frets uh, perfectly. It's going to soften them up where I've done that work. And... Uh, it's just going to round them up perfectly. I can already feel all the way up the neck. No hanging frets, no sharp edges, no anything. Then as I look in, anywhere where I have begun to round the edges uh, to get rid of any of that has softened up considerably. So as I go over it, it's going to just kind of perfect that. I feel like the top edge of the neck usually needs just more, a little more attention because the frets are closer together and they want to get sharper. So I'm going to use my brush, get rid of any kind of stuff here, and then just kind of take a look at this. And maybe you can see as that's been uh, softened up there. I don't know if you can really tell But that's gotten softer, less jagged, all the way down the neck as I've done that. If I can feel all the way up the neck, there's nothing really snaggy. Okay, 